Hello. In this presentation, I want to provide an overview of the psychobiological approach to problem behaviour that we've developed at Lincoln. Whilst the psychobiological approach covers the whole spectrum of managing problem behaviour from initial assessment through to treatment and follow up, in this presentation, I'm going to focus on the issue of studying uh, animal behaviour from a psychobiological perspective. So what do we mean when we talk about a psychobiological approach? Well, as the name suggests, we're borrowing ideas from both psychology and biology in order to examine animal behaviour. So there's nothing radically new, although the technique we've developed for assessing emotion in animals is something that we've developed at Lincoln as a systematic process in relation to clinical cases. It's about how you evaluate the behaviour of an individual in a rigorous, systematic, scientific way. And I'll say more about that later on. But a fundamental feature of the psychobiological approach is that we view problem behaviour as actions by an animal that typically have current utility or purpose for the animal in the context in which they occur, even though they result in tension for those responsible for their management or care, typically the owner. So our starting point is that we're dealing with a problem and a problem is a perception of the owner. The second thing to appreciate here is that from the animal's perspective, the behavior seems to have some functional value. Uh, we're not dealing with a broken animal. We might be dealing with a very sensitive individual and its behavior may not be immediately um, adaptive in terms of solving the problem, hence it's causing tension for the owner uh, because these animals often want to live in peace and harmony uh, with their carers because that gives them an easy life. But we recognize that we have to manage both the behavior, expectations and perceptions of the owner, as well as those of the animal. But I'm going to focus on the animal behavior part at this, uh, in this particular presentation. So that sets this approach apart from the medical approach, which features commonly in the French model and um, some of the uh, techniques that have been promoted uh, in parts of the US where the medical paradigm is, is followed in order to describe behavior in terms of disorders. We don't see the animal as disordered or damaged um, in very many situations. Rather, its behavior arises as a result of interaction from its environment, but also internal processes as well, which could be under stress and therefore have limited potential. That also makes it different to the behaviorist approach, which is uh, widely promoted by uh, particularly people with a strong uh, training background or a training in behaviorism. Whereas behaviorism will focus primarily on the environmental events and try not to make inference about internal state, the psychobiological approach does allow the inferences of internal state and sees them as actually quite important. In order to be able to make predictions, then we hypothesize about internal states and we test those predictions. Uh, we fully recognize that an animal responds to its environment, but its environment is both external and internal. And some of those internal elements are hard, if not impossible, to, to measure, especially in a clinical context. However, from a research point of view, they may be quite measurable. So the other thing that the psychobiological approach does is it rejects that nature-nurture distinction. And if you think about it, the medical approach is very much more the sort of nature perspective and the behaviorist approach is very much more the nurture perspective of it. Um, so the psychobiological approach synthesizes both of those factors and recognizes that we are the product of both our genes and our environment. But what is cr critical to this process is that we need to understand how psychological and biological processes normally function. And that includes some of these internal inferences about psychological state, such as the emotion of the animal or what the animal might be thinking or processing at that particular time. But that does not mean that we're being anthropomorphic. Um, so let's talk more about this. So if we think about it from the biological perspective, some of the key foundations that we take from the biological sciences include um, the ethological methods, um, both inductive and deductive, 
Typically, ethology starts with description of behavior and then hypotheses which are actually tested. And that is very much the approach that we use when evaluating patients or populations with a particular problem. It's important that we understand Tim Bergen's four levels of explanation of behavior. This includes understanding the function of behavior or its adaptive value, its evolution or phylogeny, its causation or underlying mechanisms, which extend from the physical structures involved in the behavior to the uh, neuroscience involved in its control, and its development or ontogeny. We also need to understand the biological basis to behavior in different biological groups. And what we mean by that is um, why behavior changes perhaps in different life stages for the individual, the goals of a young individual that is uh, attached to its mother are quite different um, to the goals of a, an adult. We don't see the young as sort of aspiring to be a, an adult. While they're young, they have particular needs at that time and their behavior is adaptive to that particular stage. That's why young often are quite um, uh, short limbed, or whatever, because that reduces the surface area and the loss of heat, which is a major challenge to them, and that imposes limits on their behavior. But as they grow and become more able to acquire resources from a wider range of sources, so obviously they need more mobile limbs and their shape changes as a result. Uh, there are also bi a biological basis to differences in behavior in the gender. Um, we often talk about uh, these sorts of differences as if they are absolute, but they are differences on average. And an important thing to appreciate is the difference between average differences versus uh, the, the level of a trait in a particular individual and the spread around that average. So for example, for a lot of the cognitive abilities, there's enormous overlap um, between different populations like different breeds. So there's a range of different biological groups that we need to consider. We consider issues relating to uh, motivation and the organization of behavior and borrow the, a lot of the ideas from uh, the behavior sciences in relation to that. And that helps us understand different time budgets in different environments, but how animals might um, shift in their priorities according to how the environment changes. Understanding things like state space models as well is quite important. Understanding the emergence of complex behavior from simpler systems, again, is, is covered quite extensively in the behavior sciences and an important underpinning to the psychobiological approach. We can have relatively um, simple rules governing behavior, which when put together can result in quite complex behaviors. Uh, so for example, what might seem like cooperative hunting in wolves has been shown that it can be um, generated by two simple rules that involve no cooperation between the individuals, just them being close to prey um, and following those rules. And ultimately uh, introducing a kill element results in uh, the capture of prey in those situations. Um, so, it also uh, reflects how complex behavior can emerge through the lifetime of the individual, through uh, the assemblage of more simple behaviors and feedback as a result. Uh, and also within evolutionary timescales, if we consider these factors in relation to Tinbergen's four levels. So each of these concepts has to be understood at that level um, as described by Tinbergen. I've put in here, understanding the behavior and physiology of the interface between the organism and its environment. What I mean by that is the importance of understanding how um, the animal is at that in interface. So the role of factors like stress, positive and negative feedback, and how that affects the individual. And how individual experiences will lead individuals to develop along different paths. But also understanding how those processes are normally regulated by feedback. So if a particular strategy doesn't work, the animal may change the strategy. And that goes for both behavior and physiology. And finally, I've drawn attention to effective neuroscience because our interest in this approach was very much inspired by the work of the late Yak Pangsept. Um, and whilst uh, we have developed the ideas further, uh, there's still a lot owed to his original ideas.
if we now consider the psychological um, elements that are particularly important to the um, psychobiological approach, then again, there are a range of factors um, or disciplines that we need to be aware of. The psychological uh, methods used uh, and the issue of validity. These are really important and not always appreciated by people coming from perhaps a veterinary or biological uh, background. But science, the science of psychology grew out of philosophy. And as part of that process, there's been a lot of reflection on issues like uh, validity, because often we're trying to make uh, evaluations of internal states that we can't access. And validity comes in many, many forms. Appreciating the difference between these is absolutely fundamental. We can have internal validity, for example, of an experiment to say that it's actually uh, measuring what it's supposed to. We can have the external validity that it applies to the wider population. We can have statistical validity in so much as uh, thinking about issues of how um, much it actually, um, we can be confident in the results and what degree of uncertainty there is. And uncertainty is an intrinsic feature of um, science. And whilst there's been traditionally a heavy emphasis on things like p-values, actually knowing things like effect sizes are probably of more importance from a clinical behaviour perspective. And, and appreciating um, what factors might affect a p-value is really very important. And finally, there is construct, construct validity, um, which is that uh, what we're inferring about is is actually uh, correct as well. So if we're going to talk about fear, then what do we actually mean if we're taking other measures to make that inference? Um, understanding this process of um, validity is what has given rise to the functional emotional analysis process that we've developed here at Lincoln for inferring emotional state uh, in individuals. And I'll say more about that in a little while. One of the other psychological methods that we um, use quite a lot is um, applied behaviour analysis. Although we use the technique, we have added other bits in order to make inferences about internal state. And again, I'll say a little bit about that shortly. If we think about um, psychology, then there are, psychology is concerned with issues of perception, cognition, cognition emotion and the control of behaviour. And these are all important things to understand and to be familiar with. Um, and that control of behaviour includes the uh, understanding how we make inferences about those internal states, what we might call intervening variables between the environment and the behaviour. The things that the behaviourists traditionally have tried to avoid making reference to. Why are they important? Well, if we make the inference about an internal state, we can formulate hypotheses and test them. Um, and we have to remember that those inferences are hypotheses and the animal's response perhaps to treatment is actually part of the feedback that allows us to evaluate whether or not these hypotheses um, can continue to be held or whether they can be rejected. And that's what makes it a more scientific process. Um, so, um, let's say we generate hypotheses and we keep them constantly under review. Um, obviously, psychology has done a lot of work in learning theory and memory, and we tap into that extensively to understand how to train animals, but also um, how to manage people as well. Um, another important area of psychology that we uh, use quite a lot within the psychobiological approach is the study of personality and individual differences. Um, and that's quite important. When we think about processes like affective processes, they exist not only as immediate reactions, they also exist in the form of moods, which have uh, more uh, enduring effects, but still transient, and then as more hard grained um, predispositions. And that's what we mean by temperament. If you think about it, the hardware underlying our emotions is constantly active as long as we're alive. It's kept under control largely by uh, inhibition processes. And uh, those predispositions you can think of like uh, different types of engine. Some engines are highly tuned 
others are much slower and more sluggish. We can think about cruising speed as like the equivalent of mood. Um, in a particular environment, it helps us to be operating at a particular way, and that's why we might develop a particular mood. An emotional reaction could be like a sudden change on the accelerator or the brake, a response to a specific situation. So the underlying neurological hardware uh, exists in three different time um, phases. An immediate response, a general predisposition of sort of medium to long term that we call mood, and a, a general predisposition of the individual as a result of its genetics and early environment, etc., which we refer to as temperament. It's also important to understand interpersonal relationships and bonds, both to understand um, social species, but also understand the human animal interactions elements that are really important to managing problem behavior as well. And moving now more towards the human side, understanding issues of counselling and coaching skills, but also the behaviour change wheel of human behaviour, which is a th synthesis of a wide range of um, approaches to bringing about behaviour change in people. And uh, you know, because that is a, a synthesis of ideas, it's a lot easier to talk about it in turn, terms of using that wheel approach uh, rather than talk about all the different approaches. We are not um, clinical psychologists, uh, we're clinical animal behaviorists, but understanding uh, a framework for the different processes and the professional skills that are available um, for changing human behavior is quite important nonetheless. So let's now look at the um, issue of evaluating the behaviour of an individual or perhaps group of individuals in order to make inferences about underlying um, motivational state or emotional state. I'll start with the uh, inference of uh, motivational state and as I said previously we borrow a lot from applied behavioural analysis and the functional analysis of behaviour in order to make these inferences. This is a rigorous uh, process, but we accept that our end result is actually a, a hypothesis that we will test through um, further experience. And this is important because it allows us to perhaps be more selective and justify the choice of interventions, why we choose one over another, because we are making an inference and we're being explicit about making those inferences. So, we start by observing behaviour and operationally defining uh, the behaviours that are of interest. We identify the immediate and the distant antecedents to the behaviour. Um, so we consider the general conditions that give rise to the behaviour, the immediate predictors, identifying when both the behaviour occurs and when it doesn't occur. We look at the consequences that maintain the problem um, behaviour. So what does the animal gain or avoid from doing the behaviour? And how does the animal's natural environment support the behaviour? What functional value might it have? As a result, we develop a summary statement describing the relationships amongst the antecedents, the behaviour and consequences for each situation in which the behaviour occurs. That's standard procedure in applied behavioural analysis. However, when we think about um, the psychobiological approach, we make an explicit inference of the underlying motiv motivational state involved, i.e. Uh, explicitly say what the functional goal of the behaviour is so that we can make predictions um, about the factors that might be regulating and how they might be um, regulating. So um, if we think about what an applied behavioural analysis might be called things like um, how the behaviour might change, then um, we're quite happy to talk about changes in a motivational state. For, exa for example, the animal may be hungry at that particular time, um, rather than talking about it in terms of motivating operations, which I think, to be honest, is just unnecessary language that perhaps uh, complicates things. Let's now look at how we make uh, assessments of emotion. 
in the psychobiological approach. Fundamental to this is actually the functional analysis of behavior that I described in the previous um, slide. And this is a skill that takes time, and I'm only going to provide an outline here. Um, at a later date, there will be a, a full presentation on this actual process, but I want to provide the framework here. The first point to make is that the um, functional analysis of behavior described in the previous slide underpins this process. Um, we um, identify the range of contexts in which the behavior occurs and what other behaviors occur in these contexts. So we not only focus on the target behavior, but we focus, we ask about what other behaviors occur in that context because we're trying to understand the totality of behavior. And we, in effect, undertake a functional analysis for each of those. We evaluate the responses in terms of the contingencies involved in triggering and suppressing the response and how these might be appraised. So we take a particular context and we think how might that be evaluated by the animal. If we think that the triggering stimulus could be appraised as a threat to the animal, then we will make an inference that this could potentially generate the state of fear. If we think it limits the animal's autonomy, then we will suggest that it could um, create a state of frustration in the individual. And we generate a list of all of the uh, reasonable hypotheses on the basis of the contingencies. We look at the cues um, to arousal level, so things like whether or not there's pyloerection, uh, pupillary dilation, uh, if possible, if we've got heart rate data, they all tell us about um, how aroused the animal is. And that can be quite important for distinguishing between an emotional response and an habitual response, because an habitual response often doesn't have the same level of arousal. If the level of arousal is inconsistent with that particular emotion that we're inferring, then we have to reject the idea, the hypothesis, that that emotion is involved at that time. As I mentioned, we look at the totality of the behaviors being expressed, and we put that together to evaluate the behavioral tendencies of the uh, individual. If we think about all those behaviors, what might the animal be trying to achieve? So rather than thinking about just the function of a specific behavior, we think about the function of all of the behaviors. So for example, an animal might prefer to run away in, if the circumstances allow, but if they don't, it may um, become more defensive and aggressive. For example, the dog on the lead. The owner has a problem only when the dog is on the lead because the dog can't get away from the situation. In other situations, the dog keeps a safe distance. So that way we can understand the different behaviors of when the dog is aggressive versus when the dog tends to wander off, those sorts of things. And fourthly, we look at the cumulative signals. And we know far less about the cumulative signals of animals than is widely supposed. And many cumulative signals will depend on other factors. Uh, so we have to look at the totality of cumulative signals, not just in the face, but in other parts of the body, um, in order to try and, again, make suggestions as to what we think is going on. And we're constantly testing the idea that uh, which of the emotions does this uh, is this consistent with and which is it inconsistent and those for which it is inconsistent we reject through a scientific process of falsification and we suggest that there are nine effective systems that we need to consider uh, and understand each of these elements we need to understand sort of the contingencies the uh, associated arousal level the behavioral tendencies and the cumulative signals and this idea has been developed out of component process theory of emotion. And that is something that uh, underpins this approach of analysis. Having gathered all that information, we systematically evaluate the evidence for and against each effective state and the consideration that the response may have very little underlying emotion and be more habitual in its nature. And we need to understand what it means to be a habitual response in that situation. On the basis of that, we can hypothesize uh, the potential affective states involved in the animal's behavior. We need to consider the role of moderators of response and temperament that I've mentioned and the consistency of their observed effects with the hypothesized emotional inferences. In this regard, uh, we have to be particularly mindful in um, dogs and horses of the role of pain, both ongoing pain, but also learned responses that uh, may moderate the response.
having done that we make predictions of um, how the emotions might actually um, be involved and we can test predictions in other contexts not yet described by the owner so we could ask them about situations that they may not have yet described and ask them how their animal responds on the basis of the predictions of the emotions that we think Finally, that allows us to infer not just the emotional reactions, but also the, the role of mood and temperament and how different emotions might be involved uh, at different times within the reaction. So an animal might be initially um, fearful and then get frustrated because it cannot access safety. So we look at emotional states and their relationship to each other. And that remains a hypothesis, an active hypothesis um, that is revised in the light of new information. One of the things about working in referral practice is that we often have a lot of new information because the animals have been treated by other behaviorists uh, unsuccessfully. And that's not usually because um, the person hasn't implemented the advice. It's because it's been inappropriate, because perhaps the underlying diagnosis or evaluation of the animal's behavior has not been um, accurate. So just to finish off a few concluding comments. Um, inferences about internal state cannot be known, but they can be inferred using scientific principles. Say so science is about uncertainty. Uh, in the psychobiological approach, we are explicit about the uncertainty. One of the things we have to be careful of is by using a systematic process and excluding competing, we um, can avoid the natural tendency towards a confirmation bias. We think the animal is anxious and therefore gather the evidence to support that. We have to consider all of the primary effective systems that we think um, can be involved in the organization of behavior responses and look at the evidence for and against each of those. As I said, we acknowledge uncertainty in our inferences, but I think that is a much preferable approach to the oversimplification of complex phenomena. Some people talk about sort of effective systems and um, the role of drugs, etc., as if we know far more than we actually do about the brain. Um, when it comes to effective systems, Panksepp again perhaps oversimplified things, talking about things as discrete circuits, whereas actually these are complex networks and our experiences we think now arise because they are states of the brain and not because there is activity in a particular region. And again, I think that's an important philosophical point that we need to reflect on. In summary, the psychobiological approach provides a robust systematic process and a scientific framework through its emphasis on falsification for the evaluation and management of problem behavior in both individuals and populations. Thanks a lot.